So this is Galatians uh, for Beginners. We're in lesson number two of this series. Um, and we're going to cover Galatians chapter one, verses six to nine, uh, six to nine Lord willing. The title of this lesson, The Dangers of False Teaching. So let's do just a bit of review to uh, kind of cover some things that we've talked about. So in this letter, Paul is writing to churches in the Roman province of Galatia concerning the false teaching that is being spread among these churches at that time. And the idea of the false teaching, we talked about it at length last time, was that uh, what was being taught uh, was that in order to become a Christian, one first had to become, well, a Jew. Uh, this was being uh, uh, proposed and taught and, and, and promoted by Jewish teachers. We call them the, the Judaizers or the circumcision party. Uh, basically, they said, if you want to become a Christian before you're baptized, you have, you have to be circumcised. And of course, I, you, know, you can kind of understand these, these, these Jewish Christians, you know, their world had changed. All of a sudden they used to going to the temple and they had the feasts and so on and so forth. And now with Christianity, well, there is no more going to the temple. They're the temple. And so there was a great change. And you can almost understand the effort to kind of hang on to some of their cultural and religious uh, heritage. Uh, but of course, this was violating the principle of the gospel. Uh, as I say, this was being taught by a group. Uh, sometimes he talks about them, Paul talks about them as the Judaizers you know, or the circumcision uh, party. Now, the danger of this teaching, it was, it was dangerous for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it added to the gospel by requiring additional responsibilities by the believer beyond a confession of faith, repentance, and baptism. They were adding to the spoken word of Jesus. And uh, this was not, of course, uh, permitted. Nothing new. People are always trying to add to the word of Jesus, especially you know, for salvation's sake. You've got to do this. You've got to buzz your head. You've got to shave your hair off. You've got to uh, you know, wear different kind of clothing. You, you know, you've got to do all kinds of things. Uh, you have to rearrange your marital status because it's, it's not acceptable for one reason or another. You know, just look at Acts chapter two, watch Peter preach. There's thousands of people there listening to him and when they say, so what must we do you know, to be saved? What, what are we going to do, men and brethren? What are we going to do? What does he say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says 3,000 people that day were baptized that very day. Now I ask you this question. Don't you think among those 3,000 people that came forward to be baptized, there were some people who had some bad habits they hadn't completely overcome yet? You think maybe there were some people in that group there whose marital situation you know, was not quite right? Do you, you see what I'm saying? You think some people uh, maybe uh, were overeating? You know, we talked in our other course, you know, I'm saying one of the, one of the big problems, you know, over, you think there were some people having trouble with food issues? And yet, what was Peter saying to them? Well, repent and be baptized. He wasn't adding other conditions. Now we'll talk about repentance in, the, in a, a minute, some of the things that it requires. So uh, getting back to my original point, this additional teaching was dangerous because it added more stuff to the gospel that Jesus didn't ask of us. Also, specifically for their teaching about circumcision, by accepting circumcision, the person was in effect saying that he was abandoning salvation through his union with Christ based on faith, and now would pursue salvation based on perfect law keeping. Now there's two systems, there's two ways to be saved. One way is perfection. Don't sin, don't break the law, don't break any of the commandments at any time. And if you do that, you go to heaven. You'll be judged, sinless, you'll be judged, you're perfect. Then the other way to go to heaven is you're forgiven for your sins and God gives to you perfection. He imbues you with perfection. He gives you, He considers you perfect 
because you've performed it perfectly? No, because through faith you have appropriated the perfection of Christ and it's been put upon you. So those are the two, those are the two systems, all right? So the danger for these people was that salvation by faith in Christ, that's possible, we can do that. That's with, despite our imperfections, despite our weaknesses, being saved through faith in Christ, we can do that. We have the ability to do that, to believe, to respond to Christ. But salvation by law keeping, well that's impossible. We can't do that. It, it, we're unable to accomplish law keeping sufficiently to achieve perfection. See, that's the point. Jesus, He lived the perfect life. He's the one that kept all the commandments. He's the one, okay, that was, He didn't need to be saved, but He's the one that fulfilled all of the commandments. He never sinned. That was the significance of His perfect life. He did it. And because He was perfect, he was then permitted to offer that perfect life in exchange for our imperfect life. Okay? So the Galatians were abandoning the system by which it was possible for them to be saved and they were going over to a system where it was impossible for them to be saved. That's what the danger was. Okay? So uh, Paul says in another epistle, Romans 3.28, just in case you're not sure of this, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. We're not saved by works of the law. Do we do works of the law? Sure, sure we do. We try to tell the truth. We try not to steal. We, you know, we, we, we attempt these things. But it isn't our attempt to do these things that saves us. Okay. So in the first verses, Paul establishes his authority as an apostle and he reminds them of the core of the gospel. And the core of the gospel is that the debt for sin was fully paid by Jesus. He makes restitution for all of our sins on the cross. I know I've repeated that, but it is so important to understand this idea. Restitution is what we owe God for having broken His laws. If you speed and it's 40 miles an hour and you're doing 50 miles an hour, well, maybe your ticket is 60 bucks plus 20. If you're doing 60 in a 40 zone, well, maybe it's 50 bucks plus 50 more dollars. If you're doing 80 in a 40 zone, then it's 200 bucks and I don't know, they take your license or something. You know, there is a consequence for having broken the, the driving law. And what happens when you get caught and judged, you've got to make restitution. And how do you do that? Well, you pay, you pay your fine. And once you've paid your fine, you've made restitution. That's what restitution is. So Jesus makes restitution for every single sin that we have ever made in all of our lives and every single person on earth. He has made restitution for us. And trying to be saved by a system of law is trying somehow to begin paying some of that restitution off. Can't do it. Can't do it. We don't have anything to give. Now, repentance, now that's another thing. Let's not confuse restitution with repentance. Repentance is a change, a turnaround. You know, the Greek word simply means to turn around. You know, like, you're, do you ever do that? You're driving, not a lot of one-way streets in Oklahoma, but in Montreal, there are plenty of one-way streets. You can only go in one direction. And it happens to a lot of people who drive in that city. They're not thinking, they turn down the street, and all of a sudden, they notice the arrow is pointing this way, meaning, I'm going down the wrong way on a one-way street, I need to turn around. And a lot of times you go into a driveway, you back up, you know, you know what I'm saying. Well, if you were saying that in the Greek, I'm going down the wrong way, I need to repent. That's what the word repentance means. It's a change of attitude. It's a recognition, oh, I'm going the wrong way. 
I'm going to turn around. It's a, it's a, it's a recognition um, uh, that we've been wrong. It, it, it's a change of attitude that I have toward God. It's a change of attitude that I have towards sinfulness. Before, I didn't care about sinfulness. It didn't matter to me, sinfulness. As long as I didn't get caught, as long as I didn't get punished, doesn't matter. But now, repentance requires that I, I do care about sinfulness. I want to do what is right. Think of it this way. Repentance is not going back and making right every wrong in your past. That's not repentance. That's restitution. Jesus has already done that for you on the cross. Repentance is forward looking. When I repent, I'm looking to the future. From here on in, I repent. What I did badly, incorrectly, whether I did it willfully or not in the past, in the future, I'm going to do or I'm going to try to do what is right. That's repentance. That's why I say on the day of Pentecost, those 3,000 people who repented, they couldn't go back and change all the dumb stuff they may have done in the past, whatever, but they did decide from that moment on that they were going to follow Jesus and that they were going to change and that they were going to do what they could to do what is right before God. And this plan, this is, this is a plan from God. And He deserves glory for devising this plan. So salvation is offered by grace. What does that mean? Well, it means because God is gracious and merciful, He's offered to us salvation based on a principle of faith rather than salvation on a principle of law. That's mercy. Thank you, God. Thank you. You could have said, hey, you want to get to heaven? Great. Just don't sin. <laughs> And even if he said, you want to get to heaven? I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. Just don't sin from here on in. Yeah, I got, I got your past covered, but from now on, don't sin if you want to go to heaven. Well, you know what, how many of us would make that? <laughs> how many of us would make it? If that was the deal, well, we wouldn't. So his grace is seen in the fact that he's offered us this marvelous salvation and all the many gifts that come with it, and He's offered to us based on faith. That's why salvation is by grace. Because of His wonderful grace, He offers us salvation in a way that we can, that we can attain it, achieve it. And we accept it how? We accept it by faith, by the principle of faith, not by the principle of law keeping. So once having done this, Paul goes on to immediately chastise them for moving away from this basic teaching. He's not happy with them because you know, they've taught them properly and now they're going back to a, you know, a, a, a works-based type of salvation. And circumcision, you know, that was the heart of it. It was like that was the, you know, that was the point of no return if they had that uh, done to themselves. So here's the accusation part. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ, there you go, for a different gospel. So he marvels at the speed with which they are turning away from God. Not that they are turning away from God, but at the speed at which they're turning. I mean, you people have just been saved. I've just saved you, well I, you know, I've just preached you the gospel, you've just avoided you know, the flames of hell, and already you're, you're, you're abandoning that. You know, the gospel comes from God, and to turn away from it is to turn away from God. He's amazed that this thing is happening so quickly after their conversion. They're at the early stage of their faith, a critical time, uh, and they're already having problems. They're in the process of turning Maybe not completely yet, but they're on their way. So God calls all men, when I say man, I use that in the generic terms, men, women, of course, humanity. God calls all men to be saved. The gospel is the tool that He uses. You know when we say, I've been called by the gospel? What we mean is that the gospel contains the message about this salvation offered by faith, and the response of faith, repentance, and, well, belief of course, and repentance, and confession, and baptism. 
That's how I'm saved. I, I hear that message and I respond to that message. The grace of Christ can better be translated as God called you graciously through Christ. A little easier way to translate what he's saying there. It is through the gracious work of Jesus and the proclamation of it that men are called by God. That's what we do. Why do we support missionaries? Well, we support missionaries in Haiti. And what are they doing down there? They're calling men to be saved you know, by faith. And we support a missionary in Africa. Why? Well, he's calling men to be saved by faith. Why do Hal and I have you know, a website? Well, I mean, after you get through all the technical jargon and you know, the, in, the internet and all that kind of stuff, what are we doing? We're calling men and women to be saved you know, by faith. We're calling them on their phones and on their tablets, but it's the same thing. So in verse seven, he says, which is really not another, another. he says, you know, you've been called, but you know, you're, you're listening to another gospel, and then he makes a kind of a editorial statement, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So in reference to the, quote, gospel brought to them by the Judaizer, Paul makes the following statement. He says the Judaizers were bringing their teaching as the true or the superior gospel, claiming that Paul was not teaching them uh, accurately. So in response, Paul says, there's no such thing as an other gospel. There's only one gospel. There's no other, there are not two gospels or five, there's just one. What was happening was that the original gospel was being changed into something else something which did not resemble or achieve what the original gospel achieved. So Paul charges these people with their true motives. And what are the true motives? You know the teachers, the Judaizers? What are their true motives? Well, first of all, they're disturbing and unbalancing them in their faith. They want to shake them up. And secondly, they're distorting and changing the gospel to suit their own prejudices. They wanted to be saved by law keeping and they wanted others to follow suit. You know, misery loves company. Error loves company. Don't you remember? You were in high school. You had the midterm tests. You know. What'd you get? Well, I got 30 on 100. <laughs> I got 28 on 100. Yay! <laughs> you know? Yeah, misery or error you know, loves company. So these people preached about Christ and they claimed to be from God, but they were false because what they preached was different than what Jesus had preached. Even today, this holds true. If what you teach about salvation is false, then you are a false teacher. You know, don't get fooled by you know, I, 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 see, I watch on TV, they don't have them that much now, but there was a time, maybe a year or two ago, that the Mormons had these fantastic commercials. Remember on TV, they were so slick, they were so cool. They showed beautiful, energetic, intelligent, young people, successful, and the guy would be skydiving and he'd be driving his car and he'd be biking and he'd be doing this and that. And at the end, the tagline says, and he's a Mormon. Because they were trying to dispel the idea that Mormons you know, were fanatics or kooks or something like that. So the marketing, the marketing effort was to portray them as not just normal people, but successful people and smart people and something you, know, you, you should pay attention. And a lot of people bought into that. How can they be wrong? They're so good looking, they're so successful. They, I, the thing I hear all the time, look at the family values. Look at the family values. They don't smoke, they don't drink coffee, they don't drink, you know. Look at the values. And I would answer, look at their preaching. You don't get to heaven on your looks. It's a good thing, isn't it? Anyway, we won't, <laughs> we shan't go there. We don't get to heaven on our looks. We don't, go, we don't get to heaven on our success or it's not a marketing campaign. 
We get to heaven based on the gospel. And if you haven't got the gospel, it doesn't matter how good looking and successful you are. You know, check out what they're teaching. Well, they're teaching that Jesus is not really the Son of God. <laughs> That's it for me. I don't care what else you have. If you don't have that, I'm not interested in everything else that you've got. So Paul quickly goes to a warning directed at these Judaizers and anyone else who would distort, meaning change or add or subtract from the gospel in verse eight. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So everybody who preaches a different gospel originally preached by Paul and the apostles, that's what the we stands for, uh, those people stand condemned by God. The Greek word there, anathema. They're anathema, they're accursed. So this includes, imagine, this includes apostles. If, he said, even if one of the 12 apostles are preaching to you a different gospel, they're going to be cursed. Even he himself. Even an angel, he says. If an angel comes, because remember, Jews, they, they, they had a very strong you know, thought about angels, a very strong uh, relationship uh, and history uh, in their relationship with angels because in their history angels had appeared to them in the Old Testament and the angel who appeared to Mary and an angel who appeared to you know, the prophets and so on and so forth. So you know, the, uh, the presence of angelic beings were, was very important to the Jews and he's saying here even if an angel appears to you and brings you a different message that person and the angel should be accursed. Well how many false prophets even in today's age claim that their doctrine comes from a vision that they've had, an angel that they've seen. And yet Paul says, even if an angel appears to you, and even if it's not like hallucination, like it's a real angel, if they bring you a different gospel, yeah, they're to be accursed. And angels, you know, they're the powerful beings next to God, in the presence of God. So condemned, not because Paul orders the church to pronounce this curse on those who distort the gospel, but rather condemned because Jesus has already condemned those who do this. Didn't he condemn the Pharisees? Matthew 23, 13, too long a passage to read. Woe are you Pharisees, woe to you Pharisees. You know what they did? Keeping people outside the kingdom because they were distorting God's word. Then in verse nine he says, and we said tonight we just do six, seven, eight, nine, just that little passage. So in verse nine he says, as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. So he repeats the injunction including any person. It includes Pharisees who are not spirits and have no apostolic authority who distort the gospel. So Paul repeats that this is not a new warning, he has said it before. Now the Judaizers were deserving of the curse for several reasons. They knew the gospel and they believed it. If you go to Acts in chapter 15, you know, they call the Jerusalem Council there where they were discussing, you know, should Gentiles be circumcised and so on and so forth, should they be allowed in the church? The Pharisees, you know, they were Jewish Pharisees who had become Christians, they were part of that a council, part of that discussion. So they, they believed, it wasn't that they didn't believe. And they were now knowingly changing their, their, their teaching despite the warnings and the letters sent by the apostles. Remember, the apostles sent a letter to all the surrounding churches saying to them, you, know, you Gentiles who have become Christians, you don't have to be circumcised. You know, stay away from sexual immorality, he said, stay away from you know, uh, strangled blood. You know. And that, and that mainly was for the, the, the very delicate sensibility of Jewish Christians who still were adhering to food laws. In the first century, the Jews who became Christians, they still didn't eat pork. They still adhered to the food laws. It was too much of a change for them. That's what, what, that's what was causing the friction in the church. Gentiles were coming in, they were like, all right, we're saved, we're going to heaven, you know, yeah, let's go. 
barbecue. <laughs> because they had no qualms about eating pork or anything else. That wasn't part of their heritage. But within that same church, you had Jewish people who were very fastidious about what they ate and how it was prepared and you know, feasts and so on and so forth. They didn't just throw all that away. They, they continued practicing, quote, their Judaism. But this here was the, the, the sore point. And of course, they were encouraging others to follow their example in this heresy. So Paul rebukes them for being unfaithful to the gospel in such little time. And then he establishes that there's only one true gospel and that was the gospel originally preached by himself and the other apostles and he uh, condemns anybody who changes it. All right, so that's the only section we're going to do. I want to just draw a couple of lessons from that for tonight and then we'll, we'll quit and maybe if we finish a little early, if you have any other questions, we can kind of discuss it, okay? So a couple of lessons. <clears throat> Number one, well, it begs to be said, there's only one gospel. There's just one, okay? In Matthew 28, uh, Jesus said to His apostles, teaching them, meaning the new disciples, those who become Christian, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus gave the apostles the ministry of proclaiming the gospel and teaching people, not just teaching people the facts and the information, but teaching them to obey the facts and the information. And, and I, I'll make a, an aside here for those who may be involved in teaching smaller children. Sometimes we overemphasize the idea of teaching them the names of the Bible and who Moses was and you know, Noah and the, and the ark and the Jonah and the fish and its story. And that's fine. You know, they, you, they have to upload all of this information. It's very important. But we're not we don't put a lot of emphasis on the idea that the purpose of uploading all that information is so that they will obey this information. Because that's what, you, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, it's both. It's I know what's in the Bible and I recognize that I have the responsibility to obey, to respond to what's in the Bible. You know, loving your enemy, that's just not like a suggestion. You know what I'm saying? To be sexually pure, that's not like just a lifestyle choice. You know, these, are, these are commands that, that we as Christians must observe. In Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus says to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has been believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who is disbelieved shall be uh, condemned. Again, preaching the gospel, but preaching that people should obey the gospel. You know, when Peter was preaching in Acts chapter two, you know, repent and be baptized, a little later on, Luke says that he continued exhorting them to be saved. In other words, he told them what they needed to do, he encouraged them to obey, and then he continued to encourage them to respond to the gospel. And that's what we do. Someone says, why the invitation every week? Why do we do that all the time? We get it already. Because as the Bible demonstrates to us, we must continue to exhort the congregation to obey, to respond to God's word. We have a couple of chances each week and we take that, whoever's in the pulpit takes that opportunity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, now I, Paul says, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Uh, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. There's the restitution. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas that's Peter, uh, and then to the 12. Why did I read that? I read that simply to demonstrate that the content of the gospel has never changed. It's the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
That's what the story of the gospel is. It tells that story. It's always the same story. And then followed up with an encouragement to obey the things that Jesus has asked us to do. So uh, the content always remains the same. Uh, we've said this in other classes. Wow, what if, what if all of a sudden you know, the, um, the, the, the Muslims take over America? You know, there's this, is it Hightower? Is it, there's a show I know that it pretends that the, that, that the Germans won, you know, Second World War, that they won. I haven't seen the show, I've seen some previews and I've read some stuff about it. And they've won and, you know, and, and America has you know, the swastika you know, flag and the Germans are in charge or the Second World War German, the Gestapo, they're in charge of Washington. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a TV series that says, what would happen? You know? And sometimes people say, well, what, what, are you, what would we do if, if the Muslims took over, if that would have happened? Well, uh, I don't know about you, but I'd be doing the same thing. I'd be looking for other Christians that I know and I'd be trying to get together with them to study God's word, to encourage them to be faithful until he returned, to take the communion. And it might not be easy, but somehow, either underground or secretly or somehow, do guerrilla evangelism. Now it's great, we, you know, we can get online. If we had a lot of money, we could buy TV. You know, we can do anything we want, get up on the tallest mountain and shout out the gospel. Uh, if we were restrained because we were under some foreign power or dictator, our job wouldn't change. Maybe we'd all be crowded into a secret place now. We wouldn't have a sign out front. But our life, our job, our role, our expectations, our hope, our message, would be exactly the same thing. It just would be a little more difficult. But I dare say the church would probably be growing at a much faster rate. <laughs> Because when things are going good and we're enjoying it and everything's gravy, you know, poof, we, we tend to take the church you know, for granted. That's why in China the church is growing so fast. Why? Because it's all underground. It's all secret. You can be thrown in jail for just having an open Bible study. There's something about adversity that wets the, the taste for evangelism and, and living out our lives as, as Christians. I hope that that's not what God is intending for us, to spark our faith. Uh, but if He did, the gospel doesn't change, our life doesn't change, it becomes perhaps more uh, difficult. Um, second lesson, or excuse me, so in the Galatian letter we see that the first attack against the church was an attack not against the people, it wasn't, you know, at the time of the, the writing of this, there wasn't Roman persecution of Christians throughout the empire. The first attack against the church was inward and it was against the gospel message itself. Lesson number two. So lesson number one, right? Lesson number one, the gospel is always the same. And I forgot one scripture here where Jude says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly, fight for. For what? The faith, the teaching, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Notice he says in the first century, which was once for all handed down to the saints. The faith, the gospel, the message, it was given to the saints in the first century one time. There is no new gospel. There is no new information. Despite what you might read on TMZ or online, that they may have found some sixth or fifth gospel or they may have found a letter by, or the bones of some guy. Don't let that rattle you. The gospel is always the same. What was delivered to the saints in the first century, we got it, we have it. We just, our job is to preserve it in our you know, era and to hand it down to our children intact. That's the task. Number two, lesson number two, judge the messenger by the message. You know, many messengers claim to be from God, superior intelligence, vision, secret knowledge, but the true test of credibility is the accuracy of the message. Reputation, college degrees, speaking style do not make up 
for a false message. When I'm talking to someone, you know, sometimes people online and so on and so forth, or I meet someone and they're talking, they want to talk to me about Christianity, and we get into it, the first real question that I ask them, who do you think Jesus is? Because that's going to tell me where I'm going to go. I once did a man on the street interview on TV in Montreal for one of our shows, remember that Paul? And I was downtown on like Main Street, St. Catharines, and I'd just go by, you know, it's just a typical man on the street, and I'd ask people, uh, so who, who is Jesus for you? Oh man, we, uh, not one person gave the same answer. One person said, he's the son of God. Okay, good, good. Another guy said, well, you know, he's like Muhammad, you know, he's just another guy. And everybody gave a different answer. One guy, the last guy that we showed on the video, he was like, uh, he hemmed and hawed for like 60 set. Well, uh, mm, uh, and then he looked at me and he said, you got another question? <laughs> and I said to myself, brother, there is no other question. There is no other question. Who is Jesus? I, I encourage you to keep that as your ace in the hole when you're talking to somebody about religion and they're trying to give you, just ask them, okay, tell me, who do you think Jesus is? You're going to find out very quickly who they are. Okay, uh, judge the messenger by the message and beware of the majority of messengers trap. The gospel is written so all men can understand it and it'll be true even if the whole world is in error. So if you're outgunned 5,000 to one somewhere and you're the only one that believes that Jesus is the Son of God and 5,000 other people are against you and don't believe that, don't worry about that. It's not a question of who's in the majority. Jesus absolutely told us that we're always, 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 to the end of time, we'll be in the minority. It's the narrow way, not the broad way. And then, thirdly, false gospels do not save. In 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Paul says that in continuing to preach the truth, Timothy would ensure salvation for himself and the church. And the opposite is also true. To fall away from the true message is to lose that salvation. The urgency with which Paul writes to the Galatians is necessary because in turning away from grace, they were turning away from their salvation. So those who preach a false gospel will be damned, yes, and those who follow it, that's the unfortunate thing, they'll be also lost. One through rebellion and distortion, the other through ignorance and foolishness. So just remember, please, please remember, there's only just one gospel. All right. Next time we get together, we're going to look at Paul's life uh, chronologically and really key in on his early life and look at some you know, very little known things or things we kind of just pass over about Paul. So we're going to take a look at that uh, next week as we continue our study in Galatians. Thank you for your attention.